for our legislative update from the Speaker's office, Speaker Theresa Lahey. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Sabrina. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, uh, all, all the, those who are listening. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, busy week. Uh, I guess we'll start with the public health uh, oversight hearing. There was a lot of information <laughs> that came out of that hearing. I mean, that was probably like a week's worth of newscast. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was surprised we actually got some information that you had not already um, broadcast because you guys are doing a really good job of getting that information on a daily basis. So, yes, I was very glad to hear the very concrete uh, vaccination plans and priorities because prior to that, they had just been so vague or they seem to be changing every day. And so I'm just glad to see they have a long term, a, a little bit of a long, I'm not a super long term, but a, uh, at least a short term plan and that we, we got our priorities uh, straight, hopefully in there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, I thought public health did a great presentation as to, um, and, you know, we're seeing the improvements at the vaccination sites and uh, it's so, uh, I'm especially pleased that they, you know, are getting the homebound taken care of. They are getting their caretakers taken care of. I thought it was an excellent decision on their part to expand that to caretakers and uh, that they they are getting to those areas of um, where seniors live. So there are some housing areas where it's uh, mostly seniors and so and those with disabilities. And so they are actually going out to those areas as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. That Cab was a Dr. Cabrera was on yesterday and I can I asked him, I think I did, I can't remember because it was a lot of information. Uh, maybe you can um, tell me what specifically was said. I think it was Annette Uggen uh, who was talking about there may be some clinics held in the villages this week, Agate, I think she said, and there was another but village. Yeah, I think when the teams go out to do homebound in a certain village, they do it village by village. So when they're out in that village, they they will they may not always, but they may open up a like a a, a mini pod site right, at right. senior center in that village for those who are mobile and can get there. Uh, they can come there to get their second shots. Those you know uh, anyone, and mm -hmm. so the it's up to the mayors, of course, to notify everyone. Otherwise. They're kind of working out of that village, so they just set up a, a second team to do it in a, a senior center, and then while the mobile team's going to the homes, home by one one house at a time. Mm -hmm. And and there was also talk about uh, money, right? Uh, was it eleven million that they got in in federal uh, federal assistance for? Is it for the vaccination program uh, exclusively? Some. So um, I don't know all the amounts, uh, mm -hmm. but. That definitely they got some for testing and we you know even last year or yeah last year they got some for testing particularly to expand that and they've got it you know now again with the with the additional uh, relief funds they've got uh, for vaccinations and testing mm -hmm. these are programs are supposed to you know set up as quickly as possible and and um I'm hoping that they were able to expand the personnel that they use so that we're not using the same people over and over. So mm -hmm. I thought one of their strategies for that was to uh, convert testing and so that not the nurses don't necessarily have to do testing with these types of kits and so that they can uh, have other people do the testing and, and let the nurses uh, stick with the vaccination and the other programs. Mm -hmm. Was there anything I guess from that oversight hearing that you felt uh, public health uh, needed to improve upon? Because I mean we did hear a lot about their response, um, yeah. they, what they have, like some 200 people uh, from public health working this COVID response from the clinics to the testing, to the homebound vaccination, uh, the quarantine facility, isolation facility. Uh, was there anything there that kind of stood out for you that uh, was a little bit of a concern? Well, I'm, I'm just concerned and I think they are also concerned, but we, are, we have to, you know, remember that everybody who's taken away from a regular duty of theirs at public health or social services is uh is concerning right mm -hmm. because uh those needs are their their health needs in the community or social services needs in the community and we don't want to take away from those so i'm hoping that's temporary but that they're also you know 
uh, just keeping a very good eye on, on whether those services are still being covered. And so I don't want to create another problem on the other end, right, from neglect or from not paying attention to the areas that they were supposed to be doing all along. Mm -hmm. So that's why I ask about, you know, sharing responsibilities amongst the, all the different staff at public health, because mm -hmm. that, that's, that is my concern. But I'm, uh, you know, the director is aware of that. And so I, I'm hoping they're just keeping a very close eye. Mm -hmm. The other thing, of course, is that we didn't get uh, full answers yet on, on, you know, the personnel issues, the complaints that have been raised like, re regarding personnel at, at the uh, quarantine facilities. But uh, I'm expecting that, um, I'm trying to remember what today is. Today's Wednesday. Uh, if I don't get that by this week, it, it, it should come in first thing next week. And uh, but in the interim, they've assured me they've rearranged um, so that the allegations cannot happen again. So we've got you know additional oversight of uh, who's doing what over there and who's responsible for what just a little bit more of checks and balances. Yeah, we right? had uh, Director St. Augustine come on last week, and then he had also uh, confirmed with us that they changed the line of what did he call it? Line of supervision. Yeah, line of supervision. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, to address right. some of the allegations in the complaint. Uh, speaker, were there any areas of concern uh, with you uh, regarding the discussion that was had about the uh, vaccination supply and the restocking of uh, the vaccination supply and also maybe the uh, critical service workers and the quarantine exemption? Yes, um, I was trying to pin them down on critical service workers, uh, you know, who those really are and, and uh, Kind of how critical are all those different categories because those are the exemptions to quarantine so yes i'm concerned with every exemption to quarantine if uh the statistics are showing us that they are finding positive cases in quarantine and we're finding positive cases that were exempt from quarantine right so of course very concerning i want to make sure um you know if our levels are low in the community, then we should be able to trace every single case and we should be able to find out where is this coming from? Why is it still spreading? Why is it not stopped? And um, so I'm afraid, yeah, I don't want it to be the reason that it's because of the exemptions that we're allowing in quarantine. So I just think um, public health has to re-examine those, really um, narrow it down to to people who absolutely have to get out of quarantine, you know, immediately. And, uh, but yeah, that they are sticking true to their word about testing these people promptly uh, so that we can stop the spread. And then of course, if they are positive, then tracing that, uh, they have to, they can't slack off on that. And uh, you know, I'm worried that, you know, we're all um, moving along and I, I hope that's not the case. So. That's why I, I questioned them about those things. So yeah. critical service workers and what was the other one you said? Um, Vaccination supply. Oh, the supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, the way it's been reported to me is the, the supply, you know, they, they request supply. It comes in. It's at this uh, kind of set amount. They've, of course, requested for more. And um, I'm hoping we're going to hear early March, whether we're going to be receiving more. The governor seems very confident when I talk to her that we will receive more, very confident. So I hope that that's the case, that, um, you know, it's got to do with the new Biden administration, they've increased production so that we can receive more. Right. But I, I, I hope that's the case because I want to get to this goal. Um, I That's one thing I think we're united on is I really want to get to that goal of 70% at least of our community by July vaccinated and like you said that is uh improving the uh allocations for guam is yep. absolutely critical because if we don't uh, i think yep. it was dr cabrera said then um it, we wouldn't be able to achieve herd immunity until well, the end of the year we won't right. be able, we won't be able to get 70 percent right. but we will i think with the current levels uh the way it was uh, shown to me we would be able to reach at least 60 percent uh by july with the current kind of uh, amounts that we are receiving mm -hmm. so still that's still very good and i would just uh, stay on track and um yeah i want to make sure of course that they, there was talk about you know second doses being held to make sure that everybody gets their first dose but i i confirmed with them that they were going to run that by their committee it was not going to be a single person's decision and that uh this committee is composed of this it's a vaccination prioritization committee is composed of doctors from the hospital, um, 
uh, public health, of course, uh, doctors in, in the community, the medical um, licensing board. So I hope that they're all looking out for all of our best interests. And uh, I know that there are many people who, especially the elderly, when they get their first vaccination, they want to complete it. They do not want to be put on hold for that second vaccination. I think that would decrease the morale, right? Of, right. Um, yeah. How they've been so motivated to go get this done. Yeah, that's why I thought it was interesting when they, and we talked about this so much yesterday, when they first came out with the vaccination effort and they were really firm on, you got to get the second shot you know, X amount of days. And then now it's like they're saying, oh, yeah, you can get it up to 42 days mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Um, I wanted to follow. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on what you, you mentioned. I think you were the one who mentioned it during the oversight hearing about uh, the isolation uh, facility uh, being moved from Bayview to another location. Uh, do you have any more information about that oh yes i got that from a press release and it named the location so sabrina i'm sorry i don't have that in front of me but i'll forward that to you I, i'm trying to remember it's a smaller place uh was it garden court yeah i think so yes yeah. that's the one okay. yes and is that um, the one that's across uh daichi that i don't know oh. if it is i yeah i think that was garden villa but oh, but okay. i don't know if that's, I don't know where this is, I'm going to find out, but uh, I hope it's, uh, I hope we're not going to find the same issues that we were finding at the other facility. It's very frustrating to have to hear these complaints from the people who are being put there, you know, especially the, at that an isolation facility means you have COVID. Of course, health is the number one, should be the number one concern, cleanliness. Those are, you know, absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And I hate it when we have to hear the complaints from those who are being put there, as opposed to those who are in charge, making sure that that's not an issue, right? Did we get so, any um, dollar figures on how much we, we've spent so far on the government quarantine facility or the isolation facility? Yes, I think we do have figures for those things. I don't have those in front of me, but we do have figures because I know that they are submitting these for reimbursement by FEMA mm -hmm. recently, right. yes. So. Uh, speaker, do you, do you know offhand how many people on average are in the isolation facilities? Average? No, I'm sorry. I don't know that information, how many on average. Curious, because it seems like part of the problem is that we get a big hotel and then, I mean, so the people in isolation, they're COVID positive, but they're at a level where they don't require any like intense medical right. treatment, right? Um, right. So I'm just wondering if we hospitalizations are down. I mean, do we need to kind of maybe look at the SNF and Barragata Heights if we're concerned about cleanliness and all that? Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, they um, supposedly, right? That was the original purpose of that site. <laughs> right. And uh, it's gone all the way around in a circle, I think, as to what we're gonna use it for. So I'm not even gonna try to pretend uh, I know exactly what they're going to use it for now. I know that they were working very recently, maybe just two weeks ago, on on another fix to the chillers or the coolers, the aircon, and um, and then and that they have upgraded that facility quite a bit to uh, to allow for critical care. So so it's actually uh, it's well beyond. It could be used for many different things, Chris. I think right. at this point. Yeah, I, and I think uh, Mr. Kando, the last time he was on, was talking about all these renovations uh, that mm -hmm. they're they're doing up at the SN, SNF, SNU, and possibly even moving back the patients that were in that facility, but since the COVID were moved to Catholic Social Services uh, without a contract. So, I mean, is that something... Um, I don't know why the AG's office... They said, that oh, the contract wasn't approved or it's held up at the AG's office... Uh, but all those patients were, were, are, I don't even know if they're still there at, uh, Catholic Social Services in, um, Barragata Heights. Does that kind of concern you that there's no contract in place for that? Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the whole procurement during this pandemic, I think is, uh, concerning, but, uh, 
yeah, we we just got to flush that all out. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not they're aware of it, so that's less concerning to me. <laughs> it's the ones that we're not hearing about that are they're yeah. still open. <laughs> that one, I guess, is on the table. AG's aware, so they they need to find a solution. Yeah. Um, speaker, you know, uh, when we, you were uh, your line of questioning about the critical service workers, and then I, I think uh, you also were discussing a little bit. Um, the variant, right? And it come up, it had come up in the discussion that if Guam were to reach levels that we had in the second surge, that we wouldn't be able to secure travel nurses or DOD doctors or any type of outside um, help because those uh, resources are now being uh, committed to uh, COVID outbreaks stateside. So, you know, that being said, when we talk about exemptions and we just talk about uh, the follow up that goes on when we send people home to quarantine, because every time we ask public health how they do with uh, policing people on home quarantine, they say they're doing great. But everybody I know who has been in home quarantine hasn't even got a phone call from them. So I don't even know what is really accurate. But anyway, just to wrap it all up here with the variant out there, how important is it that we shore up all of these like gaps and and shortcomings to prevent what dr cabrera said yesterday would be twice as bad as the second surge if the variant were to catch on guam and spread um you're right i mean we are months into this already a year into this it's it's too late to to continue to talk about we need to shore up they they promised to shore up they should have shored up they received money to shore up tracing, you know, uh, monitoring, quarantine, uh, even isolation at home, all of it. So you're right. I mean, Chris, I hear the same stories. I, I hear different stories from everybody. I even have family who've been in and out of quarantine. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's a very funny almost. I mean, it's not funny because it's, uh, you hear from public health, no, they're absolutely monitoring them on a daily basis, once a day. But that's not at all what I see from um, people who are actually experiencing it. So there is a gap. Again, there's another gap. It, it, it continues, it's continued for months. And, um, and that's why I'm afraid that our cases, even though they're so low that they linger, right? You would think they're so low that we could catch that, we could trace that and we could lock that down. But uh, they continue to linger and uh, like evade us. And uh, that shouldn't be the case at this point in the game, I think. Yeah, and, I, and I, I think it was uh, Patrick Lucis, right, from uh, Public Health who, who had mentioned when you guys were talking about the critical service workers and the changes uh, that Public Health is working on uh, regarding that exemption. So Patrick Lucis was on and he said they had a travel quarantine team, I believe, and they do do their daily checks, their daily calls, and I think it was Chima who said they hadn't found anybody that... Um, I think was violating or, or had tested positive um, that were on home quarantine for this uh, exemption. Yeah, but we just we just reported that yeah. we had the two guard members who uh, right right yeah. Right. So I mean, I would at that point I, I feel mm -hmm. like they didn't watch KUAM. Maybe they didn't get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> that or don't forget, Sabrina, that this this travel quarantine or, or critical service worker quarantine is actually you get to go to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I think it's very hard to monitor at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, we always hear these stories about people coming into these, uh, uh, like coming back from work into the military facilities, for example, with uh, bags of groceries or food or whatever. And I just, I just, to me, that just sounds like un, unenforceable a little bit. You right. know, yeah. very hard to monitor. So, yeah, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Of course, mm -hmm. the more exemptions we have. The, the bigger risk we have and it it should be super critical if they're going to put us at that type of risk yeah i think that's what they should rename it go through the list and only super critical <laughs> service workers like like super super you know what i mean <laughs> yeah well you know it's got to be worth the risk yeah. Yeah. yeah so you guys i wanted to move, move on to the budget can i just break in here okay. 803 we're kuam fm i got any guam uh, on the radio side this is the breeze 93.9 FM. Good morning. The budget, you kind of mentioned it, that public health, right? They're looking at a $12 million cut in the proposed budget that was submitted by uh, BBMR. Yes. Um, and the hospital 
school about eight million. Mm -hmm. So wow. uh, they haven't fully explained the rationale. I'm hoping to flush that out, but it looks to me like the rationale is based on because these agencies are receiving federal funds because of COVID that uh, they have less need for local funds. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, argument is kind of um, surprising because in the DOE, remember, uh, they, we heard that argument as mm -hmm. well. And then mm -hmm. DOE came back and said, uh, COVID response is on top of what we're already supposed to be doing, right? It doesn't supplant it. It doesn't replace it. It's not gonna take care of diabetes on Guam, you know, like public health supposed to be doing. And so all of those mandates that they have, I just wanna make sure that they're going to be taken care of. And so we gotta pay close attention. I think the good thing of course, is that Medicaid uh, is changing. It may change and it, it's expanded. And then and then that's, that's great because that frees up some money for public health to use for other purposes within their budget. But, Any um, yeah, so we did receive that budget. Uh, that's a, you know, overall in the government, there's a big cut, about 20 million. And so that's on top of the 67 million that we cut last year based on reduced wow. revenue. So this reduction in revenue, I mean, it's critical. It's affecting our critical services now. I think it's very obvious that we're going to see that in the upcoming year. And um, I asked, they said this continues to fund personnel. But uh, uh, yeah, I need to see closer the impacts to the services that we are providing. And uh, I just think we have to make sure that those are prioritized with this type of cut. And um, uh, yeah, we we have to, uh, yeah, there, there are some smaller agencies, for example, like land management, right? Where when you make a cut to an agency that's only receiving a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, it's a huge, um, huge impact to their services and so we just have to take a very close look at those i want i want to make sure that the government is operating fully to provide services that the businesses need so that there's no delay we hear so many complaints about delay and i like i said before i think yeah they've got to speed everything up they've got to be on hyperdrive the government right now we're providing services for businesses so that they can catch up everyone can catch up all of this, of course, to take care of our families, open our schools, and, and um, make sure that we can do that all safe, quickly. Do you see any um, cuts to agencies that aren't necessarily needed uh, or are, um, aren't providing priority services at uh, this time or that may be luxuries? Uh, yeah. It's not obvious at, at first glance, so mm -hmm. yeah, I have to spend some time. I'm hoping we're going to hear... Uh, you know, some presentations on, on the revenue projections themselves, right? And so we are opening businesses. I'm hoping our revenues will pick up, but uh, the projection looks even worse than FY20, yeah. right? So, Speaker, kinda... Speaker, do you think that the entire process will be uh, more cooperative uh, this session with the budget as opposed to some of the things we saw the last couple of years where, you know, Lester Carlson, they didn't even show up sometimes? Well, I think it needs to be, I, th I hope everybody, um, we have no room for any of that. We we only have space, I think, with when we're facing cuts to critical government services, such as healthcare, that everybody should be sobered up and straight up. And, and we just got to go with real, you know, with the truth and hiding the truth is not going to serve anyone and uh, delaying these, these very frank discussions that we have to have is not going to to serve the interests of the public. They, you know, I think that causes great anxiety. You know, we when we're not when the legislature's not able to see things, the public's not able to see things. The legislature's not able to act swift enough. You know, it it has huge impacts, and um, so I I just hope that's not the case, Chris. And of course, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure of that. Uh, can we move on to the judiciary? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. So we, obviously, there's more stuff that came out of this uh, Mark Mayo trial on, in the district uh, court, um, which uh, there was allegations made about warrants being wiped. Um, uh, but when this came out, me and Bree kind of just did a quick search of our archives, and then I remembered that obviously this issue had come up during former Mayor Jesse Blas's hearing. 
And I remember at that time you had had an oversight, right? And the last we heard in at the end of 2019 was that um, uh, the Chief Justice Justice uh, had assured you that uh, they were investigating it, right? So has there been any follow-up with that? Or where are we now? And do these new yes, well, allegations my understanding is, concern? Well, first of all, when we had that oversight, that was probably the first oversight of the judiciary that had ever been done. And uh, at the time, I was criticized because of uh, separation of powers. You know, does this violate separation of powers? You know, is it really proper for the legislature to have oversight of the judiciary? And I thought, actually, yes, this is the perfect reason why oversight exists. It's because um, the judiciary is acting as law enforcement in this in this um, in this. Uh, matter and uh, you know the marshals were acting as law enforcement and in that in that capacity absolutely yes uh, I think they should be subject to oversight uh, at the time of course uh, the chief justice had assured me that they had spoken with the FBI and that there was no one there under investigation and that they had completed their own internal investigation and it's you know um, so that's those are the facts I know uh, I think the conclusion was that either, you know, FBI was not pursuing anything there at the judiciary because mm, none of the people involved were still there, or I don't know the reason. I can't speculate for the FBI or any of the law enforcement why they're not pursuing more, except that they, I think uh, the judiciary looked at it and said that um, without any more information that, that they've, um, you know, done their investigation. And then, uh, but our oversight, I, I wanted to make sure that even if they had found nothing at that time, that these types of allegations could actually not occur, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we found was that um, the more discretion that is given uh, to individual marshals, for example, as to what they are, which warrants they would pursue that day or would execute that day, um, that maybe that was a place where they could, um, you know, um, just tighten their procedures on so that uh, less discretion or more checks and balances. So we did discuss that. They did review their process and uh, they did tell me that they were putting into place some some checks for that to ensure that uh, it wasn't, you know, that the discretion was reviewed at least and that it wasn't totally limited. But they, the other thing is that, you know, some of these allegations make it sound like uh, it's the judges that are in on it, right? right. Uh, that is the judges that are vacating warrants because only judges can vacate warrants, not marshals. And uh, so, you know, the judiciary is very concerned about that, especially this recent allegation. So um, I think I'm having a meeting with the Chief Justice on Friday and I should uh, hear from them what, what they have um, either done or will do in, in this regard. These are you know, taking place, it sounds like at the same time period as what we, um, you know, had our oversight on um, in 2019. So, yeah, but it's very concerning for me. This is a law enforcement matter. It's kind of like if the law enforcement are finding things that need to be investigated, then, you know, I surely hope that they are investigating and that right. they are, you know, we're just not hearing about it because of it's, you know, classified or something but other than that if they have any reason to believe something as serious as that is continuing to happen at, at the marshals then then i i absolutely implore them that they need to get on it yeah of course um you know our our legislative powers we can investigate things that we can find you know um the fact that we we're not law enforcement uh, unfortunately but and so i am going to rely on the ag's office the police department, the marshals, and, and any other law enforcement that they want to bring in to make it look more objective or to be more objective, then they should do that. It's interesting um, with these federal drug trials and this most recent uh, Mayo trial, um, when they played that uh, audio recording of the FBI agent interrogating uh, Mayo, and uh, he was like, hey, who are the dirty cops, you know? Who are the dirty customs officers, you know? Do you know anyone at the port? Right. So so clearly the federal authorities are just throwing it out there that we've got some dirty cops, the dirty customs officers. Uh, how concerning is that uh, for you just dealing with the, the public confidence in these institutions that 
I mean, the court? The court is supposed to be above reproach. And it sounds like it, it, at least at the time of these trials, is very corrupt. Yeah, I don't know how um, widespread, although, right, the corruption very concerning, any corruption. But uh, it's like, you know, the allegations against public health. I feel so bad for those frontline public health nurses that are working every day, every weekend, and yet when there are complaints made against, you know, a couple people, it, it ruins all of their kind of reputation and morale. So, you know, I'm just hoping that that's the case at the court, that this is a very isolated type of incidence. I don't know. I don't know. And, uh, but I'm, I very much expect that law enforcement to, to do their jobs and, and to let us know what it is, what it is. Just like at the, at the port, same thing. We hear rumors, you know, we hear, uh, I hear even DEA agents stop me on the street to say, hey, you know, keep asking questions, keep asking questions. But it seemed like a very complex, sophisticated, um, you know, drug investigations that might be going on and, and uh, but without, without public conclusions, at least right now. And that's yeah. all I know. So I, yeah, that's very hard for me to pursue, right? Yeah. I, I, I also need. Uh, but I mean, I, I feel like it's fair to say that you guys would definitely have a vital role in this because we can't really just sit back and expect these bodies, these entities that are the subject of these al- accusations and allegations to investigate themselves, right? Right. Of course, I think, yeah, we do. And I, I, I for one, um, take that very seriously. So um, that's why I'm following up with all of, all of uh, my oversight um, committees and that's why I try to attend these oversight committees uh, hearings and and ask the questions and you know uh, sometimes it's it's surprisingly you get criticized for asking questions uh, maybe yeah. in you know field, right but uh, <laughs> I, I up to now I can't understand that it's it's kind of like you want me to do my job or not right and my job is if I am not understanding what might be going on or if I cannot pursue what has you know been told to me on the side as a potential you know criminal activity or potential political you know uh, washing of the situation then um, you know I would not be doing my job so um, it bothers me a little bit you know at first when people criticize or, or even more seriously you know say hey you know you're you're going after one member of our family at the port and um you know we're all of that i'm like come on we're talking about the government of guam and we all are in the government of guam and we want the government of guam to look as best as it can to be the best that it can and so i don't know if i'm if i'm the manager at the port i would i would want scrutiny and i would welcome it and i would say you know give it all you've got and then when you clear us we're clear you know what i mean or, or yeah i mean speaker i can't even wrap my head around that farce of a oversight hearing at that no disrespect to uh, senator talina but um, really you're right I, I felt like it was beyond control and and people are getting attacked for just simply asking questions and so when you hear these federal agents talk about and during interrogations, who do you know at the port? But then you have the general manager of the port saying, oh, there's no evidence drugs are coming in here. And just, you know, putting his heels in the ground. And, I mean, really, he continues to attack you guys for, like you said, doing your job. And I, I don't know, at what point does the governor call uh, Rory down to Adeloup and say, hey, you need to chill out a little bit, man? <laughs> I don't know, but you, did you see yesterday's uh, hearing, uh, oversight hearing on, on customs, right? right? Customs reported zero uh, interception of drugs at the port in the last five years. Zero. And uh, so what's your conclusion from that, right? Something is wrong. It's either we are, wow, our, there are no drugs coming in through the port or they're just not reported or they're they're just not looking, right? And so I don't know. I just feel like we are on the side that the legislature has to look at all sides. We're trying to we're trying to take care of people who are addicted to drugs. We're trying to take care of law enforcement that is understaffed and needs to, you know, get a handle on these drugs in the community, stop the theft of homes and burglaries and all of the crime that's going on. And yet, yeah, we are 
you know, we can't have a free flow in any of our any of our ports. And so uh, that's I I still believe it's very critical for us as a legislature to make sure that we do everything in our power to stop the drugs coming in at all of our ports of entry, all of them. Uh, anyways, Chris, can I, uh, I just want to remind yes. your listeners that so we, I called the legislature to session on Friday and that's at 10 a.m. So that will be this Friday, the 12th, 10 a.m. It's our first session. Uh, it's about, um, this, this week is about a month from inauguration, but in this month, I, I want to say um, this legislature has been very busy. So I don't know what will be on the agenda on the, on the um, okay. session. That would be decided in today's uh, Committee on Rules meeting this afternoon at 2. So people can watch that on YouTube or on, on the uh, legislative channel. But um, otherwise, they could see a list of it. And then they could go to the website and, and read the bills themselves or read the committee reports and see exactly what the legislature is going to be discussing in session on the 12th. But in this one month that we've had since inauguration, uh, the legislature's actually had six oversights. I feel like I'm at a hearing every day. So it's it's really, um, uh, I feel like they're, all my colleagues are working hard. I always think I'm working hard, but they're all working very hard, I think, because uh, six oversights, that's actually a lot. It's like, you know, uh, and Keep they were up. over DOE, Guam Land Use Commission, Port Authority, Department of Labor, Public Health, and the Customs, of course. And they've had about 57 bills introduced. This is a huge amount compared to, you know, prior years. And so uh, at least like for my committee, I've, I've received about 37% of the bills uh, referred to my committee. So we are hustling to try to get hearings for these and, and you know, get these heard. Right. Uh, Joseph Augustine's committee, uh, the appropriations has maybe over 50% or maybe 40, 44%, uh, 40, in the 40s percentage of uh, all the bills referred to his committee. So he too, you know, we're struggling to, to find enough hearing dates and get these heard. But uh, there's quite a bit of bills, a lot of them dealing with pandemic, of course, biz, uh, response to businesses, taxes, uh, infrastructure, some trying to take care of uh, just the government services like land, you know, land application, land use application reviews, make that faster. Um, we've got that workforce housing issues that have, that have, uh, that are coming up as well. We had a hearing on, and so that bill's being reported out, but, uh, also utility rates, uh, all kinds of bills. And, uh, so I'm just, uh, I'm just actually very impressed that they are, everybody seems to be working hard. I'm, I'm seeing good attendance at the hearings, uh, Excellent questions. I have actually been impressed by some of the questions that my colleagues proffer at these oversight hearings. So I'm very happy for that and the hearings on, on the bills. So. Uh, speak, anyway, yeah, speaker. I just wanted everyone to know that's Thank coming you. up and they can check out the right. bills that are going to be discussed uh, on our website. I kind of wanted to just the uh, last question here on, on, on that note, right? I had asked Crystal Pacos and Augustine about uh, the open government law, which was I think the first thing that was suspended at the onset of the pandemic and uh well never got an answer but um i'm just curious at what point do we unsuspend the open government law because it seems like i mean let's say we open the game rooms we're talking about opening the bars um we're doing all these face-to-face -face things i just really don't understand why that hasn't um even been discussed so when you talk about hey we're having session friday i was just thinking like they don't even i don't think you guys are even obligated to announce anything because the open government law has oh, been suspended. I mean, I don't know. Not. Well, maybe, I don't know. We haven't really gone down that road whether the legislature is obligated to, you know, follow the open government law under these pandemic uh, executive orders or not, but we are. Yeah. I think the legislature absolutely is. For example, I gave out notice for this uh, session. Right. For, uh, and the two days notice was just yesterday for the session and so I made it very clear to my staff, we are going to follow the open government law no matter what. And I'm, I'm with you, Chris. I think the, the rest of the agencies, they, sh they have no reason not to be following open government law at this time. Uh, we've made it very convenient for them by allowing by statute um, teleconferencing or, you know, uh, that so they could, that could take place if necessary. But uh, the goal, of course, of open government is to get public input. So 
uh, we just have to try and I'm, I'm you know talk to the all the staff here at the legislature to try to make sure that we understand we have competing roles we're trying to protect ourselves from COVID protect our staff from COVID protect the public from spreading COVID yet public input is critical so we have to you know accommodate that we have to allow for that we have to encourage that and welcome it so in any way that we can we're trying to do that okay you good yeah well, thank you speaker thank you, thank you. Be safe. Take care, Sabrina. Have, have a good Jason. session break a leg break a gavel <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 824, this is the Speaker of the 